Uh, let's bring in two colleagues now from the Parliamentary Press Gallery to talk about some of the key events of the day. Tana McCharles is a reporter with the Toronto Star. John Iveson is a columnist with the National Post and Parliamentary Bureau Chief for Post Media. It's good to see you both. Thanks for uh, taking time to speak with me. Tonda, uh, look, let, let's discuss the crisis in Ukraine and what we're seeing here in Canada by way of a response. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering what you think is, uh, has been standing out for you in the response we've seen uh, to this crisis and the positions taken by federal political leaders in this country. What do you see? Well, look, the Canadian response has been um, pretty much tied and aligned with uh, the response of the Allies. And I think that, that everybody has remarked on uh, the effectiveness of that coordination. And so it's starting, it seems, to be felt in, in Russia. So uh, the, the overwhelming coordination of it, that's impressive. Um, on the political side in Canada, I also was struck by in the first several days of after the invasion started of the government responding to it and rolling out day by day uh, actions, including lethal and non-lethal aid, as well as humanitarian aid and all these economic and financial penalties, is that the opposition parties were largely all behind the government in its steps. You know, if they're, if anything, they're asking for tweaks, they're asking for more, but there's no real um, attack on the government for having failed Ukraine. That kind of language we haven't heard. I mean, right. leading up to the invasion, you did hear uh, quite sharp criticism of the government on the conservative side for being weak, but uh, we haven't seen that since this whole thing started. And the fact of the matter is some of the financial and economic measures are very punitive and are having an impact. And I think we're starting to, John, I think we're starting to see as well as this progresses, we see, a, uh, you know, it, it becomes this two-tier response, right? There's the sanction side and, and now the, uh, you know, stepped up pressure and stepped up efforts by the government to look at the humanitarian side as well, trying to speed the process of Ukrainians trying to come to Canada. But what are your thoughts on the Canadian response? And, and, and I guess, uh, what do you think we should be prepared for as this goes on? Well, I think the, the, the response has been pretty sure-footed. I think it's been impassioned, particularly from Christian Freeland. Uh, I think that they were in lockstep with the, with, the, with the Brits when it came to getting Russia off the SWIFT payment system, which was, was a major uh, achievement. I mean, it didn't seem like that was going to happen at, at one point. And they've been fully supportive, obviously, of, of, of efforts to uh, f uh, freeze the activity of the, the Russian Central Bank. And all these things are having an impact. I mean, there are reports today of Russian oil companies not able to sell its crude, even at discounted rates. So these things are biting in Russia. Um, the, on the other side, supplying non-lethal and lethal aid, I think Canada's ability to supply lethal aid is pretty limited given the, uh, the state of our military at the moment. And I think that that is something that Canada is going to have to really look at in the next budget. We saw Germany more or less doubling its defence budget, I think the, the, the pressure will be on uh, Christopher Freeland to you know, start funding things like the radar system in the north, which is, which is antiquated and is not fit for purpose, uh, to expedite the fighter jets, which have been long, long overdue. Yeah. I mean, Andrew Leslie said today on Twitter, he said, I know people won't agree with me, but Canada should be preparing for war. And I think that that is exactly right, that this is a long, drawn-out process that you know, even if it takes a few years to get some of this uh, military gear, yeah. uh, this is not going away anytime soon. And Tonda, the Prime Minister uh, has warned that sanctions will have a negative effect on uh, some parts of the Canadian economy as well. Uh, look, this government's compensated a lot of people and in industries during the pandemic in, in particular. So uh, there may be an expectation that the federal government will uh, compensate any industries hurt by the sanctions uh, that uh, Canada uh, mm -hmm. lays against Russia. But it's, it's not clear the government's prepared to do that, right? You were writing about that today. What are you hearing? Well, look, uh, the Prime Minister did use a word in French, compenser, so that could be compensate or offset the pain. Um, but certainly we've heard a couple of other ministers speak on it. Mary Ng spoke on it today saying, yes, they're looking at talking to industries and to see if they can do something. But I think it, that might be something that uh, there will be an expectation if, if there are companies uh, sort of 
shall I say, innocently hurt in all of this, in the blowback from the sanctions. Um, but if there are uh, companies or assets that are held by Russian oligarchs who are sanctioned, I think that's a whole different uh, kettle of fish. So um, that's something I think that politically the government is looking to be somewhat careful around. But yeah, the warning is to the Canadian public more broadly, like there's going to be an increase in the price of gas. There are going to be commodity price increases. Um, it was interesting that the Minister of Industry, Philippe, uh, Francois-Philippe Champagne, today saying, but there might also be opportunities here for Canadian industry. You know, um, uh, critical miner minerals, suddenly Canada's looking like a pretty mm -hmm. safe supply. That's the argument, by the way, that the Conservatives are making on oil and gas. Suddenly, Canada looks like a safer, more reliable energy security partner for Europe. But yeah. why aren't we capitalizing on that? So, um, so many political, I think, uh, what? the word you know uh, there's political fallout political advantages and disadvantages to all of these steps that they're going to be taking yeah but i agree with john look it's a long game this is not by a long shot over well well let me let me go there john uh you sort of touched on it but there are more and more appeals from ukraine for nato to invoke a no-fly zone over ukraine and so far not on the table from canada and other nato partners uh but do you think that's inevitably uh where we're headed if if, if this goes on i mean you have the um, clearly ukrainians are thankful for everything uh, the Western democracies are doing, but at some point, uh, how long can they fight the Russians in the street before they need help from outside? Well, I think there's going to have to be some very deft footwork by, by governments in the West because this war is playing out in real time on people's phones. They're watching this, uh, these gruesome, macabre scenes from Ukraine, and there's going to be more and more pressure to intervene. I think if we do intervene, then that is a declaration of war. I mean, even the, the idea of a no-fly zone. If you if you impose a no-fly zone, you are blowing Russian planes out of the sky. You are attacking where they came from, the the, the landing strips, the defences in Russia. I mean, that is a non-starter. I actually think that Putin might even view the the military aid we're giving at the moment, even if we're just supplying materiel, not right. people, might might view that as an act of war. I mean, he may escalate just on the fact that we're we're sending, uh, you know, anti-tank missiles, et cetera, et cetera. So we're in a very dangerous spot right now, and we're clearly not dealing with somebody who's, who's a, a, a rational player. So, you know, I, we can expect him to, to escalate. You, if you read the interview with Fiona Hill in uh, Politico, she's the, the pre preeminent Russologist right. on, on Putin. She thinks he will use nuclear weapons. Okay, uh, look, it's a bit of an awkward pivot, but let me make it uh, and come back here and talk about uh, the Conservative leadership uh, race, which is not uh, open yet. It's not actually launched. There's only one candidate, uh, and that's Pierre Poilier. But uh, Jean Charest is meeting in town with some Conservative MPs to test the waters. Uh, and I, I was struck today at the caucus meeting uh, how interesting it was and how many MPs either didn't answer or, or openly answered said, no, I'm not going to bother meeting with Jean Charest. Uh, and I... You know, you know why are why are MPs, some of them, organizing uh, Tonda, a draft Charest movement, and what would Charest bring to the race? Well, I mean, he'd bring some competition, wouldn't he? Um, he's a big, huge name, um, but the question is, you know, is uh, that a competition that would actually get him to the leadership? Um, Pierre Polyev has already sewed up so many, the support of so many um, Conservative caucus colleagues, not a majority yet, mm -hmm. you know, some, I think it's under 30 so far. But, uh, you know, Charest it would, be, would be a very prominent moderate candidate and present a different centrist face to um, not just the party membership, but to the country. Can that win the party membership? That's the huge question. Um, there's a lot of people who think that, you know, he doesn't win unless there are, there's a critical mass of, candidates who are similar to him and they can coalesce a whole bunch of organization and support because Jean Charest hasn't been uh, deep into that party in more than, what, two decades, three? Yeah. It's a long, long time, right? And so it's a different party from when he was there before. There are different sort of groups and wings underneath underneath the, 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 the Conservative Party umbrella, shall we say. So it's not clear to me if he can do it on his own, um, if he would draw in more memberships to the party. But right now, this is a party that looks very different than when he left it back in, what was it, 95, yeah, 90, yeah. 94, 95. What are your thoughts on uh, on the, the, the a, a possible Jean Charest candidacy, John? Well, I think he may well run, but I don't think he's likely to win. I mean, at this at this stage, it does look like a Poilievre coronation. 
Um, I have talked to some MPs who are not enamoured with that idea. Uh, maybe Patrick Brown will come in and maybe he will be a, a, a serious mm -hmm. contender. But if I was a Conservative, I'd, I'd be looking at what Paul Yev is saying at the moment. You know, for example, he, he talked about the weak response in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was going to be voting in this race, I'd want to hear, well, what would you do as leader or as Prime Minister even? What would you do? It's slightly worrying to me that he's a, he's he's been a very effective attack dog, but but we're talking about a potential uh, somebody running the government, and uh, I don't think he's been under that much scrutiny so far. All right, uh, all right, uh, lots to watch. Uh, thank you all uh, both for your time tonight. Appreciate it, Tonda and John. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Uh, take care, both of you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Good night.